Hey everybody, I'm Lee with Olson Equine and today I've got a good friend of mine, Blaine Chapman, with me. Howdy. So good to be here. today we're working at ESMS Equine Sports Medicine and Surgery in Weatherford, Texas, and I got a really tough case that I was working on. An acute laminitis case that's turned into founder, meaning the coffin bone is rotating and it's very gloomy outlook. Um, so I called my good buddy and he ran down here and pretty awesome of him to come join us but we we're just going to talk about what we're doing but first off um, Blaine has officially joined Team Mustad um, which isn't which is kind of funny because you've been using their products and your dad has since for how long since well my dad started probably in the mid 80s 85 6 in the early 90s right in there um, within that time frame and all up until the day that he died and then I, I actually did mustad clinics for a while when they had clinician program and and um so anyway it's they contacted lee and i'm just kind of getting in contact with people at mustad so it looks like i'm gonna get, be back on board and i'm, I'm happy to be that because I, I love their products and use their products for years and and um so and they've been very good to the industry as a whole as far as anytime you know that anybody needs something it seems like that that as a national sponsor for all the events that farriers go to, Mustad's always been, I mean, they've always been there for, for years and years for the farrier. And, and obviously, I mean, obviously, if, if it wasn't for us, it'd be tough for them to, to have business too. So it, it works both ways. So it's, I'm glad to be a part of it. That's awesome. Just like any good partnership, it needs to go two ways. And um, Mustad, what I, I love what you said about them. They, um, it's not just about selling the most products they give a lot back they uh, educate the farrier industry and and all of st croix is the only steel shoe made in america that's pretty cool god bless america that's right yeah. all right so let's talk about what we're working on today so so this horse i'll uh, put the x-rays on here that you can see but as you can see this horse obviously has some coffin bone rotation but that's not what's going to kill this horse this horse has a very gloomy outlook and right now we're trying to save him we want him to live i love and i hate these cases because i really care about the horses that i work on like blaine and when it works it's it's awesome but a lot of times with this terrible d disease of laminitis that's not always the case is it yeah, it's tough you know and there's a lot of different ways to approach it you know there's um and it's it's really interesting um i'm going to probably talk about this at the hoof care summit too as well about um i'm speaking at the bernie chapman memorial um, lecture this year and, and um, it's going to be my topic's going to be kind of based on laminitis and founder and, and heart bar shoes and the different methods of how we treat these cases from a me mechanical standpoint and, and all of the things that we use nowadays that seem to be successful uh, most all of them in my opinion um, stem from the use of the heart bar shoe and how it was built and how it was applied and, and from that one shoe came so many great methods and great ideas and great minds that have uh, come together and, and collaborated to make different shoes like the clog, like a hospital plate, like a, um, I remember when we didn't have hospital plates. I remember we didn't, I mean, we, there was so, uh, Equithane uh, products, I mean, uh, must add packing, hook packing products. Mm -hmm. We didn't have all those kind of things. And, you know, a lot of times they used silicone back in the day and a lot of those were kind of uh, corrosive to feet. So, the things that we can that we have available to utilize for for in our in our arsenal of, of products is is all of it stemmed from one shoe Absolutely. one man's idea and and um so it's it's really cool and you know talking about this horse today you know it's it's always beneficial to 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 get something on them and get something on their feet mechanically from the start uh, along with the systemic medications and stuff that they can do from a veterinary standpoint so um but it does get tough you just no matter what you, you can't save them all and i'm not from the school of thought well you he was going to live anyway i mean i just don't believe that i think that there's a lot of horses that have benefited greatly from the use of mechanical applications as far as horseshoes hard bars clogs um edss frog support pads mclean pads any kind of product out there so um thankfully um, Mustad has a lot of great products that that are along those same product lines that we can use that really have been tested in the field and work really well. And so today, um, sometimes we don't necessarily need a heart bar shoe. We might take a, like in this case, we took a Mustad uh, aluminum equilibrium shoe 
um, we took a uh, aluminum treatment plate and we utilized our Mustad product and we we used a medium type uh, material that whenever it where it, when it firms up and cures it's 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 not soft it's not hard but it's firm and then we allowed that to to cure with a little bit of space between our plate and our product and then we used our bolts to to mash it down on the foot and give support to the back half of the foot and um and i think that another thing that we got talking about a lot is um you know in founder and laminitis horses rotation is a big word it's it's used everywhere that rotation he's got this much rotation that much rotation or they'll just say oh he rotated he's screwed right and and, and you know and so you know i have a I, I, I struggle a lot of times with the interpretation of that because of um the hoof capsule distorts it it moves it migrates it can do all kinds of, of things um maybe it's just hasn't been put in the proper place and then the horse has uh, an acute onset of, of founder acute laminitis and then so you've got this this distorted hoof capsule that's run forward and then we put a dorsal wall marker on that and then we put a dorsal wall marker on the parietal surface of the third phalanx and we use that gap to determine how much rotation he has we'll put that x-ray on there too what he's talking and so in my mind that's that is a gives you a false sense of what is actually going on within the hoof capsule and it gives you an idea of what's going on with the hoof capsule, but in essence, we're in. If we were looking at a horse at a vet clinic and they took an X-ray and said this horse has got a negative palmar angle, um, we've got to get him elevated, get him back to normal. So most of us don't even know what normal is. So I think that we have to look at a, even a foundered horse. We have to look at his bony column alignment, P1, P2, and P3, and how they align with each other in relationship to each other. And so by doing that, that's going to that's going to give us a better indication of the true displacement of the third phalanx more so than a dorsal wall marker on the hoof wall and a wall marker on the parietal surface of the bone giving us a false reading if the hoof capsule has been distorted or migrated proximally up the foot you have two kinds of displacement you have third phalangeal displacement either from a rotational aspect or from a sinking aspect and then you have the dorsal wall that that can migrate proximally and so in those two instances you have two forces competing against each other and then you get the occlusion of blood supply at the coronary band and then you when you get that obviously stuff starts to die so we have to we have to figure out a way to put that put those back into perspective where they can where you can get some blood flow back to those areas and you can grow some new foot all right so for the people that might have that might have blown by just to break it down simplistically if this is the coffin bone and this is the hoof wall right here and everybody wants to worry about the coffin bone coming down but like this horse right here that's not his problem his problem is that the hoof is moving proximally moving up and it's cutting off all the blood supply to the coronary band correct right and if anybody ever listens to any of mark caldwell stuff mark caldwell you'll hear him a lot of times say uh, about ground reaction force you, we hear that a lot now in, in the farrier world, ground reaction force, ground reaction, GRF, ground reaction force. Well, you have a ground reaction force, so you got the, the, co the, the hoof capsule itself, and it's a solid cylindrical structure, and it stands on the ground with this weight on top of it. So my hand here, it'd be like the hoof, and my, my, this hand here is going to be like the ground reaction force. So it's solid. This doesn't move. And so this up here has the ability to move, right? And so now within this hoof capsule, you've got a shaft, which is the bony column. And this bony column is like a piston in a motor. It can go up and down. And, it, and so that's in the, inside this hard hoof encasing of the hoof capsule. And you've got this soft tissue inside that's torn loose. And so it's moving on the inside. The ground reaction force keeps the hoof wall stabilized and solid on the ground. And then as the bone pushes down through the weight of the horse pushes the bone down through the center this this hoof capsule can't do anything but go away from the ground reaction force and if the coronary bands here if the coronary bands there it shoves up into the coronary band cutting off the blood supply to the cuticle or the coronary band region or the the circumflex artery and vein of the coronary coronary groove of the coronary cushion and so it the, we we forget about that 
when we're looking at these horses, we get too so concentrated on the circumflex artery and vein that we forget about what's going on at the top of the coronary band where the hoof actually grows from. And so, so not that both are not important, but I, do, I think that we have to be careful not to forget what's going on at the cuticle. Like if you, if you hit your, nail, ham, your fingernail with a hammer and you drill a hole in it to relieve the pressure, it's still got to grow back from, from your cuticle. It doesn't grow back from out here where you trim it off. It grows back from up here. And so all of that has to attach together and grow back down. So the coronary band can be a better place to look and be, be aware of than just looking at the bottom of his foot and his bony column alignment. Not the bony column alignment. That's a, we can get into a discussion about this all day. So I'm just trying to keep it simple. But I think if we're looking at bony column alignment, even in a foundered horse, we have to look at P1, P2, and P3 and their relationship to each other versus their relationship to the dorsal aspect of the wall and the parietal surface of the bone. Once we know the horse is foundered, I mean, those things are kind of prognostic indicators and they're indications of what we need to do and what we need to address in order to get this horse's blood supply more viable and back in order. That's just, that's my theory. But so, in summary, pretty much there's two things you've got to watch out for. The circumflex artery, which runs around the bottom of the Absolutely. coffin bone. So when it rotates down, it can pinch that off. But then when the hoof wall comes up, it's going to get the artery at the coronary band too, right? Right. And then, and then as you'll see in a lot of venograms, if you take a venogram, you'll see a little bit of blood supply at the coronary band, but then it, then it stops here. And then you have an open occluded space. It's just dark. And then you'll see a little bit here at the distal end around the around the peripheral edge of the coffin bone. And so what you'll also see in those venograms is when these horses bone does move distally, that that circumflex artery and vein will kind of lip up above the distal end of the bone. That doesn't tell you that the horse is gonna die. You may lose a little bone. You may lose a little bit of bone around the end of his uh, coffin bone. But if you can get the blood supply back there in order, then you know a horse can live with just a little bit of bone in his foot. I mean, a bone loss in his foot. And we see it all the time. So it's a matter of of trying to, to troubleshoot and do the best that you can for the horse and 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 help him the best you can to give him a uh, the ability to come back and grow a new foot. Absolutely. But I, I think that that supporting the back half of the foot, no matter what method of mechanics you use. I think you have to do that. I don't know that anybody's ever um, really done well with a, a truly foundered or a horse that's truly in trouble um, in his laminar region that's not a metabolic horse, that's really an acute founder situation that you don't utilize the, the back half of his foot from the tip of his frog back. I mean, well, if you don't, you don't well, you, well, if you don't, every whatever size of shoe you put on him, you just gave him that much farther to fall, right? Exactly. You can put an egg bar on a on a, and this is this is a theory. I mean, the, the hardest thing about about farrier business is it's it's theory based and anecdotal evidence based medicine. So when you're looking at it from a veterinary standpoint, you're looking at you're looking at evidence based medicine. The veterinary they want to see okay, we know that if we give dormosedan at this rate to this size of horse this many times, this is what happens every time, 99.9 percent .9 of the time. So they can take that to the bank, and that's the way that their minds are. Veterinarian is a very, uh, they're very scientific, and they have, and it's really difficult to intermingle those two uh, professions if you don't understand how each one of them think. And so, from from back to my point, we were talking about. I got off the subject a little bit, uh, but you, any of those products, we've got to utilize. Uh, you, if, uh, what he was saying is if you put an egg bar shoe on a horse that's bone wants to fall through the bottom of his foot, all you're doing is lifting that foot up off the ground, three eighths of an inch, five sixteenths, whatever size stock you're using, and then you've put a you've put a circle around this this casing, and now the the piston can just drop down through the bottom further because there's nothing supporting the bottom of his foot, and we know through Caldwell, Ovenick, Russell. Uh, Dave Duckett. We don't want to forget Dave Duckett. People forget about him. Robert Eustace in England that most people have forgot about how much he's he's contributed to the founder and laminatic horses in the early 80s. Um, those guys are, they did a lot of research on this stuff and we know where the center of the foot is. We know where we can add support 
and the bone won't tip over that particular place if you get it in the right spot, three eighths of an inch back from the apex of the frog. And then we've also learned that utilizing the whole back half of the foot instead of just the frog, we even get that much more uh, effect of the mechanics in that shoe. So I think utilizing the entire back of the foot is a much more um, realistic and uh, safer and more successful application than, than, a, than a shoe that just, like an egg bar shoe that circles the foot and doesn't have any kind of support to the internal structure of the foot, like an arch support in your shoe. So. Right on. So it's not just about the support on an x-ray, it's about the support getting the foot right where it needs it. Absolutely. So on this horse, like you said, it was capsular rotation where the hoof was pushing up and choking off the blood supply. So what we did is we grooved the coronary band. Any place it was jammed up, you cut a deep groove, right? Yeah, we just, and, and, and so, the biggest way that that's successful is you have to get to the base of the coronary groove. And if you don't know what the coronary groove is. Can't chicken out is what he's saying. You can't chicken out. He's got two chances, one slim, the other's none. I mean, you, a lot of times you got all the gain and nothing to lose. And, and, um, and I think you, we still have to be sensible about what we're doing. However, I think that there's got to be a method behind the madness. And, and so at the hairline, it's paper thin, whereas, whereas cuticle starts to grow. As it starts to grow out, the further it gets down the hoof wall, it starts to widen out until it makes the thickness of the hoof wall. And you have to get to the base of that coronary groove and get that cleared out and get that opened up so that the occlusion of the vessels can be unrestricted. And the horse is actually trying to do that on his own if you look at his foot. He's got serum leaking out of this coronary band from to from quarter to quarter he's already wanting to relieve it and it's already done most of it and hopefully we haven't just compromised all our blood supply where we don't have any any way to grow new new hoof wall second of all we hope that we haven't lost enough uh, attachment below that so we can keep that foot intact and together and keep it as stable as we can until we can get him some foot grown out and get everything to reattach and and save him so our biggest goal right now is to get blood supply back to his bone back to his get him growing some foot and um hopefully keep his keep his hoof capsule from falling off um in the meantime so those are our those are our um those are those are our negatives that we have against us today we used one of these bad boys joe netto told me about this thing it's awesome but, so ultimately, if this was the hoof wall, Blaine came in and cut a groove like that. So ultimately, but he did it really deep and all the way around. But what that's gonna do is that when it pushes up, it's gonna stop it here. So all the stress that was jamming it up, all of a sudden now it's got a little bit of room. Just kind of like in concrete, what do they call that? A break? That uh, a stress deal? Uh, yeah. Same thing. So. You're in essentially, essentially the base of the coronary groove is about three quarters of an inch below the coronary band, um, right in that area. And, it, and you, you get if you can get down that far, get that opened up. What is the what's the what's the downside to it? The downside to it is the hoof capsule wants to rotate, wants to migrate proximally. So it wants to actually, if this is the the bone, this is his, say this is his fetlock, this is his coronary band and this is his hoof wall, as this wants to migrate this away, even if the bone is stabilized and not moving, if this wants to move this away and it cuts the blood supply off his coronary band and his cuticle, once you remove this much here and you get this unoccluded, then you still have this wanting to do this and, and possibly put pressure on this part of his bone. So those are the things that we're having to deal with as well. So that's why we want to really support, move his heel back as much as we can on this particular horse. And that's why we wanted to use so, the firm so, right. that, so that we could give it really, really, lots of support on that. Because if it was too soft, it would just have given. That's why it had to be pretty firm with our uh, hospital plate that we put on, right? And we let it and we let it set up enough where it was starting to firm up. Then we bolted our bolts down into our shoe to tighten it up quite a bit and give the amount of support we needed. Sometimes, and, and theoretically, 
what that's doing is you've got the shoe attached to the foot you got the plate here as you as you push it down there it, it kind of can pull that hoof capsule down and away from continuing to migrate forward but you can take that hoof capsule right now and you can still move it with your hand so it's uh this horse is he's he's not out of the woods by any means if if you know it, it takes as much praying as it does shoeing Hey Amen. What'd you say? All this horse needs is what when you're in there? Lots of prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of God. Well, I I think it was positive though. I'm I'm oh overly optimistic all the time, and that's probably why I have a hard time with these cases when they don't make it. But um, yeah, we I'm saw some healthy hoof growth in there though. Yeah, you you. It's you, trying. You you see his coronary band's not. Uh, his coronary band looks healthy. He's he's got some. He's he's got a really nice healthy coronary band. One problem that you see, you hear this all the time, or I hear it a lot. We need him recumbent, we need him recumbent, which they need him to lay down. We need him to lay down. If he'll lay down, he'll be all right. But then what happens is they lay down and then everybody freaks out. Oh, he's laying down all the time. He's not getting up. <laughs> so we have to really, and we're in such a convenience style world. And I'm the same way. I mean, I'm, I'm no different than anybody watching this video. I, I mean, I want to be able to fix them all. It's just however at the same time we have to be realistic and we have to say okay at what point are we being inhumane at what point do we need to say you know what as optimistic as i am as positive as I, as positive as positive as i am as much as i believe in it at what point do we say hey you know this is this is not this is not going to be healthy and and I, so that but i think that we got to give him we've got to give him some time I think I think that's accurate, but also there's a lot of people that just as soon as they see those X-rays, they're just like he needs put down. There's there's a lot of cases that have made it. Oh and, man! And and uh, my personal opinion is it's not our decision to judge if it's the value of a horse. And the value of a horse has nothing to do with how good they are. There's some of them are very important emotionally to horses because they've got them through tough times in their life. I've stopped judging people on that. I. I get that, and then there's also the monetary situation where it's a million dollar broodmare or whatever, and her babies are worth a ton. I mean, you can't judge that person either. Once you put yourself in that spot, I mean, you're gonna take a lot of money away from your from yourself and from your family. So that humane line is a hard one. I, I see both sides, I'm, I'm just saying, this is, Laminitis is a very tricky spot for everyone involved. Would you agree? Oh yeah, and you know there's and, and there's a lot of different ideas and a lot of different trains of thought on how they should be treated and and um, and I'm not sure that any of them are incorrect. I think that you have to take each individual case. That's that's what's a, the the tough thing about talking about veterinary mindset from a from a clinical setting and a and a a scientific perspective where you know that this many times out of this many times this works versus the farrier's theories of I know that I've done this this many times and I've had this much success doing it and so when you're looking at foundered and laminated courses it's so hard to have a control group and a founder group and there's been some research and stuff done on these things um, they've done some carbohydrate studies carbohydrate overload studies and they've shot these horses and done some different things systemically to them to get different um, scientific results and experiments but at the same time you know you look at a, a metabolic horse versus a horse that that got salmonella or got septic somehow from colic and 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 they all develop a different style of laminitis a different it's all the same disease it just affects them all differently and it and they deal with it differently so each one of those individuals we have to look at all of the the components from the radiographs to the horse to what kind of foot he has to um, what kind of sole he has what kind of wall he has um, just how tough he is um, his personality I think all of those things we have to really have, have to be able to read in a way that and, and then try to figure out what what's our plan of action for this horse's future and what do we expect of him and so and I think everybody's got a different opinion on that and that's that's where some of us, but I think it's great because we can bounce those ideas off of each other and we can, we can learn. Well, that's the important part of case studies though. Like I listened to a podcast from Doug Russo 
the other day who's an amazing man right does on. a lot good for the industry but what he was talking about is anecdotal is such a, a prevalent thing in the farrier industry because like we don't have to read a book about how a chronic laminitic needs shot it's just we know this way works or this way works or or whatever condition with a horse we've done it we've seen it we know but does that make us right and does that does that mean there's not a better way is the is the more point the better point i believe because if if we were there were actual studies on everything then there'd be a road map for future farriers to skip all of our things where horses had to go downhill so for us to learn i think that's the worst part about our industry is that we have good experience from bad situations, and if we could skip that, I think the horses would benefit as a whole. What do you think about that? Well, yeah, and, and, and like now with YouTube, you know, you got, you've got you uh, got the steward method. Um, you look at stuff that Rick Redden does. You still look at stuff that stems from Bernie Chapman. You look at a, a lot of the different methods that, that are being taught today and utilized today. I think that there's a lot of information out there that you can read and study on each one of those different protocols. and um, and I think the, the thing that my take on it over the years of seeing it from, from the ground up, from starting of at the, at the very beginning to seeing some of the very first resections, seeing some of the very first tenotomies, seeing some of the very first heart bar shoes without using hospital plates. I mean, before we had glue-ons, before we had clogs. I mean, there's so many, I've seen it, the industry change in the last 25 years. Um, to all kinds of different methods. The thing that hasn't changed and the thing that has always been something that I think that we can't get away from is utilizing the back half of the foot. I think all of the methods that are successful, whichever one you use, you're utilizing support and stability and stabilization from the apex of the frog back. And I think without that, working on foundered cases, you're shooting yourself in the foot. And, and I don't think that anybody can argue that point, um, really, whether they're using an ultimate, whether they're using a... Anything. Yeah, anything, whether they're doing derotating, whether they're just using heart bars to hospital plates, or using impression material, spider plates, whatever, the steward clog, um, any of those products, or McLean pads, frog support pads, every one of the products that we use today that are successful in the treatment of a truly foundered horse or truly acutely laminated horse utilize some type of support or protection of the back half of the foot. And so if you don't do anything else and you don't like any of the methods, that's one thing that I think that you should figure out a way to utilize because that's gonna be your oh, for biggest sure. that's gonna be your biggest helper. For sure. Well let's wrap this up. So you you've got a presentation coming up at the summit. And don't miss that. The International Hoof Care Summit in Cincinnati. It's January, February, something? Yes, January. January. That's awesome. It's a great event. AFA convention's coming up uh, in November 14th, I think, or 7th. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's going to be Little awesome. Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah, Little Rock. Uh, there's so many uh, places this industry has for all of us to grow, and it doesn't matter what level that you're at you're at there's um, there's always more to learn and I think that's my favorite part for sure and Blaine's presentation is going to be amazing his dad uh, Bernie he didn't create the heart bar the heart bar was clear back in the dark ages they found him what what he did in my opinion is give it a real purpose and show people how it worked and it got so bad that um, it was so crazy what he was doing helping horses that you had to unplug your phone at night from people calling of all hours oh, can you yes. imagine yeah, we didn't have cell phones, and, and um, that's how Dr. Pollitt um, came over here and started dealing with them um, and became an expert in the world um, of, on the subject of founder laminitis. He, uh, his horse here had been to the convention in the 80s and came back. They had a founded horse at the University of Queensland where he's the uh, head of research and development now and probably one of the most brilliant minds in the world, in my opinion, on founder laminitis. And, Dr. Pollitt asking, he said, well, 
what do you think we should do? And this guy said, man, I, I don't know, but he said, there was a guy in Texas <laughs> and he had this shoe that he put on a foundered horse and this is what he did. And he was explaining to Dr. Pollock and he said, well, what did the shoe look like? And so he said, well, he goes, I don't know, but he goes, so he drew in the sand in the barn, a picture of a heart bar shoe in the sand. And then Dr. Pollock started questioning him. Well, how do you apply it? How long do you make the bar? That's something a horseshoe wouldn't ask. That's a scientist for you. That's they ask awesome. questions. You know, the horse goes, oh, okay, I can do that. And they go make this bar. They don't know where it's supposed to go. They don't know how it's supposed to fit. But Dr. Pollitt, in his, his scientific mind, he started asking questions. Well, how long does it have to be? Where, does it, where do you place it? Does it just go on the frog? Does it go on the sole? Um, does it, do, you, do you put pressure on it? Do you take, why do you do it? And he goes, I don't know. But I found this guy's, he goes, I've actually got this guy's phone number. He gave me his card. So he took my dad's card, and Dr. Pollitt called my dad, Bernie, Chapman, most of you probably don't even know who he is, not even old enough to remember him now. And anyway, so he called my dad from Australia and he came and stayed with us for a month. And so that was my first introduction to Dr. Chris Pollock. And that was his first introduction to um, trying to figure out a way to solve the mystery of founder laminitis. So that sounds cool and everything. But if you think back about that era, I mean, right now you can YouTube anything, in any topic you want. You can look it up and find it. Well, that that was groundbreaking, and do not miss his presentation. Um, get to convention, get to the Hoof Care Summit, and I hope you guys are all doing great. And I really hope this horse that we worked on over here is going to be doing great and makes a full recovery. So I'm going to do three talks at the, at the summit. One's going to be the Bernie Chapman Memorial. In my, what I'm going to do is I'm going to base it on. The beginning of the heart bar shoe and working on foundered horses the successes the failures and moving all the way forward to where we are today so i'm going to talk about who he was how he started how the heart bar came about the different methods that they tried and uh, that's going to be the bernie chapman memorial talk um, i hope you attend um, i hope it's uh, beneficial um, i'm going to do one on shoeing the club footed horse um, actually i'm going to do a lot of studying of Simon Curtis, so I'll know what to do. And then uh, <laughs> then I'm going to do another one, I think, on... Uh, um, he doesn't even remember. I can't even remember, but Jeff Cota knows. Shout out to Jeff Cota, International Hoof Care Summit, great guy. Hank Chisholm, doing a great job with the AFA. I hope you attend both. That's right. You're supposed to have a cool sign-off, like Anchorman, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I'm That's gonna... how the cookie crumbled, maybe? Yeah. No? And that's how the bone rotates. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day and God bless America. And that's how the bone rotates. Actually, the capsular rotation. <laughs> on this one.